questions here? Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. All right, let's see. I have a uh, let, uh, let's, let, let's wait on the microphone. <laughs> IMF plans to sell uh, yes. 12 percent of its uh, gold. Yes. Uh, How me, yeah, okay. Let me address this because I've heard this question 50 times already. I mean, ever since they announced it, the next day my email gets flooded about it. Yesterday I, I was in Stockholm presenting. A bunch of people asked me the same question, and guess what? Well, who was the guy? Just asked me five minutes uh, d during the break the same question. It doesn't matter, and here is why. The IMF has been selling and selling and selling and selling, and so what? Since 2001, the price of gold went up from 250 to 1,000. So the price of gold has gone up while they were selling throughout this year, these years. First. Second, is this the first announcement that the IMF is making? No, this is like their fifth or tenth announcement. The ECB made five, six or seven announcements and they were selling and it didn't affect the price of gold. Now, other central banks have been selling and it didn't affect much the price of gold. So when the environment is right, all the central bank selling in the whole world cannot do much. I mean, you got to understand that the value, the value of gold at current prices is a drop in the bucket. All you need is five large hedge funds, five mutual funds, five pension funds, and at the current price of 1000 they're going to buy it all and all the gold in the world will disappear. And the IMF uh, fund that wants to raise, how much are they going to raise in your opinion? How much? I don't know, 20, 30 billion, 50 billion? The answer is 50 billion is a small amount in the hedge fund world. You take two good quality hedge funds, they're going to buy it all. And they say thank you, you know, for selling it to us so cheap. So these are typical news and the question is, well, why would they do that? The answer is they want to manipulate the price of gold. The price of gold in central bankers' minds must not rise. Rising price of gold indicates that there are some problems either in the financial system or in the banking system or in the currency world or somewhere else, maybe wars, maybe political stuff. Whatever the problems are, rising gold price will tell the whole world. It is the barometer that tells everybody else that something is not right. It is also like a thermometer. It says 50 degrees centigrade. Oh, it's extremely hot. What's going on? So gold is something that central bankers never want to see rising. So they keep announcing, they keep selling, and nevertheless, the price has gone up already four times. So next, uh, before you get in next, they plan to do that in a matter of five years. And they're going to dribble it in, you know, let's say 50 tiny little sales. I mean, these are so tiny that they will not matter at all. I hopefully answered your question. All right, the next one. Do you think that they can continue to control the price of gold when it's measured in fiat currency? No, the they can't. Yeah, the, uh, uh, There's no more gold reserve. Okay, There's there is no only one. The reserve currency anymore. Right, there is only one in one way that they can control the price in fiat currency, dollars and euros. One in one way to stop printing the fiat currency in order to make its supply fixed and then to provide a fairly fixed ratio with the quantity of gold. As long as they continue to print the, the fiat currency, dollar, euro, whatever, it is impossible. They can certainly slow the growth of uh, the rise but they can slow the growth in the short term, but in the longer run, it will be much more higher and much more explosive. So by natural phenomena, it could rise at 35%. And they can suppress the growth to 20 or 25% for a couple of years. But then the price will 
oh, oh sorry the growth will overshoot to 50 or 60. eventually the market takes over and eventually the market will compensate for all the disbalances or imbalances that had been accumulated in previous years is this answering your question Okay, what, 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 uh, let, hold on, <laughs> try, try the microphone, try the microphone. Okay. All right, so let everybody can hear you. Um, I'm sure you've spoken to some end of the world theorists before <laughs> that talk about the potential of 90% of the world going to one world currency as a result of what's happening right now with the dollar. It's almost worthless. In Amsterdam, I tried to take dollars to an exchange house. They refused to exchange. Good luck, um, right? At home, I'm from Dominican Republic. They're now accepting euro more readily than they are United States dollars. And what's happening is the dollar losing its status as the reserve currency of the world. If gold and silver, platinum, palladium continue to be priced in dollars, of course the price is going to go up because dollars are almost worthless now. Yeah, so ideally that. thinking, if we are some of the world's elite, we're Rothschilds, we're Bilderbergers or what have you, right. we want to go to one world currency so that we can maybe peg the dollar, not peg whatever that currency is going to be called, the Amaro. Right. I'm sure you've heard of that, the Amaro to the gold at oh, yeah, yeah, 50. Yeah, yeah, the Amaro. It, and now it's jocularly called the Amigo. Uh -huh, I've, I've heard that as well. <laughs> <laughs> because it's good. Okay. All right. Uh, I understand the question. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Yes, the dollar is the clear and sure loser of all currencies in the world. There's no question about it. It's got a big social security problem. It's got big wars. It's got a generous Congress that spends a lot more. So the question for, uh, let's call it the uh, secular, you know, multi-decade weakness of the dollar that the dollar will be losing 5, 10, 10, 50 times its value is the sure thing. So far we've had what he's talking about from 71 up until recently, maybe 2003 or 4, the world was on a dollar standard. Uh, all things were measured in dollars, but the dollar was not directly convertible to gold. So this regime has been called Bretton Woods II. Bretton Woods, original Bretton Woods was from 1945 all the way to 71. From 73, it, we've been running on this floating fiat currencies known as Bretton Woods II. Now, what you're saying, absolutely correct and widely recognized by the media by now for the last three, four years, is that Bretton Woods II is now dying or practically already dead and something has to replace the dollar. But it does not have to be one world currency. Some Bilderbergers and other guys may want to get that one currency, but the Russians aren't that dumb to buy it for it. They just have the rubble, you know, uh, to stick to gold and make their own currency. And if you have the world currency and everybody uses your currency as a world reserve currency, you have a distinct advantage because you can benefit from it to issue the world reserve currency. Just like the United States was doing so from 45 to 71. So, Russians will definitely will be not in their interest to support such a currency. They'd rather have their own to be convertible. Well, what about the Chinese? Chinese aren't dumb either. They're actually phenomenally smart. They are <coughs> buying gold. They will, at some point, peg their own Chinese yuan or the renminbi, you know. They will peg it to gold and make their currency convertible when the time is right okay, for them. So, at that point, they will not support any other world currency. Well, they will want their currency to be the world currency, just like the US dollar has been the world currency throughout the 20th century, and the British pound was the world currency throughout the 19th century. So as Bretton Woods II is collapsing, now whoever emerges to have the next world currency will reap phenomenal benefits, and therefore there will be competition to make the next currency convertible. So it is not likely that it will gain tremendous support. Of course, Americans will be eager to get this new world currency and they can benefit yet again. 
similarly for the British, but they are uh, countries with weak currencies, weak fiscal and other problems, and Russians and Chinese are not going to be them to do that for, for the favor of US and uh, Great Britain. So, in order for them to benefit, they will certainly not want to go that route, but have their currencies convertible to gold eventually. Well, the idea is, again is Putin's been buying a lot of gold. Actually, all what he said was, oh, we aren't selling any gold on the world markets. Whatever we produce, we put it back in the central bank, and we're going to build our reserves, possibly to make the, the Russian rubble convertible, and to have uh, also uh, oil sold in Russian rubbles. But for this, you need some sort of convertibility to gold. Otherwise, it's not really uh, good. Is this uh, kind of answering your question? More questions? With Iran getting ready to start this course where they're going to price oil in euro or something else. Okay. Do you think it, they may price it in ruble? Uh, who, Iran? Uh huh. Oh, no, no, Iran will not want to price it in the, in, in, in rubble, certainly. Well, you know, Iran and Russia are We're bedfellows. Hmm? Iran and Russia are bedfellows, as uh, oh, yeah, with North yeah, Korea. Yeah. The I'm three saying, have a trilateral they're, agreement. They're bedfellows, but they're bedfellows because they have a common enemy, right? So, uh, again, they're bedfellows against the United States. That's, that's how much they're bedfellows, right? It's because they have a common enemy. So there is no problem. Iran will run its thing in Euro and whatever they want to do. Russia will run its thing in rubles. And everyone will be happy as long as it is not the U.S. dollar. And again, the Chinese will be happy. Now there is some talk that uh, Iran is also beginning to sell some of its oil for Chinese currency to the Chinese, and they're also selling some oil to, for Japanese yen to the Japanese, and they are accepting from other Asian countries either the Chinese currency or the Japanese yen. So they are doing their thing, and they will just keep doing what they want to do on their own pace and with their own terms. Do, do you guys want to go with more questions like this, or do you want to uh, so go through a little bit some more of the presentation? <laughs> I see you, you're enjoying yourselves. I do too. All right, so let's talk, let go quickly through portfolio analysis. This is a third type, completely different type of analysis. A portfolio is a number of assets which, whose return you consider jointly and whose risk you also consider jointly. Number one, which makes gold an outstanding element for any portfolio, is that it is uncorrelated to other investment classes. So if it is uncorrelated by adding some gold, you will have a diversification effect and diversification implies or means that you will lower the risk of your portfolio by adding some gold. Of course, the key question is, do you add 5% or 10 or 20%? But the mathematics is sure. You have some gold, the risk will fall. Of course, there's always an optimum amount if you are trying to get the minimum risk or to minimize your risk. The other is, uh, characteristic is that gold is clearly negatively correlated with currencies. Currencies go up, gold goes down, and vice versa. This is a natural consequence of the fact that gold is priced in currencies. Next. I already mentioned it, provides excellent portfolio diversification. This also implies that it improves the portfolio's risk return profile. In other words, for each portfolio, you're going to have some risk and you're going to have some return to compensate you for that risk. You can get your gold in the portfolio and you can maintain the return and still lower through diversification the risk so that you're going to be getting a higher return for the same amount of risk or the same return for a lower amount of risk. In either case, your risk return is improving. It's the same old question. How do I make the most amount of money with the least amount of risk? And gold is part of the answer for anybody's uh, portfolio. Now, scholarly research 
is this is related to part one recommends anywhere between 5 10 and 20 percent in other words you cannot put your gold 100% to be uh, in, in uh, your portfolio to be 100% gold because now the portfolio will be floating entirely with gold. If you have some bonds, it's going to be less volatility. So scholars, professors, different, I mean, you have dozens of research. Some will say if you have five, five will be optimum from risk return point of view. For others, indicate that 10% of your money should be in gold in order to you know, improve, meaning to maximize the return risk. In other words, the return per unit of risk. And of course, others compute to be 20%. Well, the answer to this, why some gets 5 and another 20, the answer is very simple. It depends what period they used. If it was a commodity bull market and a gold bull market, of course the ratio will go much higher. Of course, if you take a period entirely in a commodity bull market, you may want to get and turn out to be optimal to get 50% of your portfolio to be in gold. Of course, if you get a commodity bear market, it may turn out that 3 or 5% will be optimal, possibly even less. In other words, what part of the cycle you're looking at will determine to the extent of optimality for gold as a percentage of your uh, portfolio. Now, another recent academic research actually shows that despite the common belief that gold is much riskier than stocks, in reality, it isn't. Now, the other important characteristic I explained a little bit uh, a while ago is that gold is highly correlated with commodities during the boom phase of a commodity bull market. But during a recession, like in 1973-74 and 1979-1980, gold distinctly turns negative correlation to commodities and commodities in a recession turn down and gold begins to move up. In other words, the worse the macroeconomic environment and the overall inflation, the better the performance of uh, gold. And finally, which I can't develop here today, maybe on the next uh, meeting six months from today, I can develop in great detail why gold stocks cannot really replace gold bullion. Now, bullion means two things. It means either gold coins or it means gold bars. You have some to, to take a look uh, here at both. The point to this simple uh, uh, explanation is, is straightforward. Gold stocks oftentimes float and correlate with the, gold, with the stock market. So, as there are some problems, gold stocks may actually not hedge you against stock market problems, but gold stocks will go with the stock market. So, if you're having 50% uh, stock market and 50% gold, you will lower your volatility. But if you have a 50% stock market and 50% gold stocks, you're actually 100% exposed to the stock market. So a stock market crash will bring down your gold stocks. It is often observed that in a financial crisis, gold stocks will crash while gold itself will take off. That's why gold cannot be replaced by gold stocks as it is commonly believed. Next is behavioral analysis and behavioral analysis simply uh, tries to work out the psychology of people. Like people don't understand well gold. Well, why they don't understand gold? It's not that their people are stupid. I mean, people understood gold for 5,000 years. It is that it is no more studied in introductory macro. It is not studied in investments. My investment textbook, which I'm using for the kids, well, I don't use it because it's not a really great book by Bodie and Kane, but the whole world uses in investments by Bodie, Kane and Marcus, has one paragraph on gold and one paragraph on commodities. You know, for these guys, commodities and gold don't exist. And 99% of the world doesn't learn and know anything about it because simply 
no textbook covers it. Well, I do in my lecture spend an inordinate amount of time so that I know that my kids are well educated, but the general public doesn't because it is not in the educational. Has anyone studied anywhere about gold? More than two sentences? No? I mean, it's usually gold is associated with greedy people, you know, trying to whatever. But otherwise, with uh, what are its investment properties, do some proper investment else? No. Now, gold is not yet widely recommended. I mean, you're a distinct minority that kind of gets the idea as one of the first people, meaning you have the Warren Buffetts and George Soros's of the world, then you have a number of hedge funds and other stuff, but from the ordinary people, you're still one of the first who get at least exposure to the idea of gold if you're still not yet carrying today gold in your pockets, meaning putting your own money into, well, this is, I put in my own money here, <laughs> paid a thousand almost dollars for it. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, uh, you're getting a good exposure well ahead of everybody else, ahead of the masses. I mean, this is like 2000 or 2001 and you're buying real estate, well before prices went up and well before everybody else, else rushed to buy it. And then prices triple and quadruple, right? Again, gold is still unloved. I mean, what's the big deal about gold? I mean, it produces nothing, right? That's the typical stuff. I mean, there is no real value, just nice and shiny. Of course, women love it for jewelry and that thing that shines here on this finger, right? But beyond that, no real value. The point is, it has, but it is yet not well understood. I mean, how come for 5,000 years, human civilizations, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, of course, Western European civilization, of course, American, as first as they saw gold, they always chose gold, okay? You got to understand that for 5,000 years, there must have been a good reason. Well, I spent two lectures in my introductory macro to explain why are the reasons to choose gold and not some other stuff, all right? So, gold is also under-owned. I mean, how many of you actually have friends, not yourself, have friends not present that own gold? How many of you? Friends, meaning like relatives. Can you raise hands? Oh, one, two, wow, you see? Ten people have friends who know somebody that, you know, owns gold. Well, apparently gold is on the round. I I imagine now, well, how many have friends or relatives who owns a house? <laughs> now a big laughter. Of course, everybody knows dozens of people. Well, there you have it. So, for every hundred people that own a house, only one at most owns gold. So you still have 99 who have yet to buy gold. This means that you still have plenty of buyers to drive the price higher, as it will, and you'd better buy before the price has been already driven sky high. Of course, George Soros and Buffett, for example, of course, they were the first early buyers. It's, hard, it's harder, hard to buy even before them. I mean, I've been buying since 2001, selling. I've been buying gold 255, 260, 270, like five, six years ago. Uh, I was buying silver at 430 in 2002. Again, but, you know, I didn't buy other things, of course. <laughs> I mean, it involved some sacrifice. Anyway, gold is very hard to value. CFA means Certified Financial Analyst. This is the thing. If you get it, you're certified and you can provide financial investment advice. You can tell the people what to buy and what not to buy and why it is good to buy stocks. Well, the problem is that these CFAs have no word in their training on, or their exam on gold. They are uneducated about it. Again, I'm not saying they're stupid. I'm just saying nothing in the textbook. So here is the other problem. They are taught and trained, like most folks in finance, to value cash flow. That's what they study in corporate finance. That's what they study. Well, Gold doesn't generate any cash flow. You just buy it today and sell it sometime later. In the meantime, it doesn't generate cash. 
These guys are baffled even at the thought of how do we even value something which doesn't have a cash flow. Real estate does have cash flow, okay? Well, of course, they're even baffled at how do we value wheat, which, of course, uh, you know, everyone will laugh at because we all know how to value wheat, right? I mean, at least you go, you buy, there's market. I mean, people understand why wheat is good. But these guys are baffled. Well, how do we measure the value of wheat? There is no income. There is no cash flow. Again, this is a major problem of the current financial and educational investment educational system and it's a good way to exploit it while it's good, right? Gold is still undervalued. I repeated this in the first section on the cyclical analysis and in the fundamental analysis. And as Bill Murphy from Gata likes to say, hey, the public still doesn't know how to spell gold, do they? Well, gold means nothing. This, this is very interesting. It's very interesting. Uh, again, I don't want to pick on you. I had a friend in Columbus, Ohio, who was telling the story. It's a phenomenal story. 2003, the guy's a coin dealer, a like gold dealer. So he buys and he sells gold. And he says, I see this kind of black guy with a mask, but of course he sees that, with a gun. And he says, robbery, robbery. And, you know, and everything. And, you know, he thinks it's some kind of a joke, right? So. Turns out that uh, the guy goes around and sees a sheet of $20 bills. He takes the sheet, he takes some other banknotes, and then the guy says, well, uh, a whole bunch of gold on the table, meaning, you know, just like there is one over here, whole bunch of gold on the table, you know, the, you know, the guy just passes by, skips the gold, gets some other banknotes, and then he sees the ultimate prize, a $1,000 bill. So, he takes the $1,000 bills, he takes the 20s, there is a little bit on the cash register because the dealer usually deals with, for larger amounts, with only with checks, right? And then he takes off. And now the guy scratches his head and says, well, uh, it must be that my friends, you know, made some joke. So, they took like $400 with a gun and the mask and all the great stuff, uh, and uh, they took a $1,000 bill. There was like for 10,000 or more gold and the guy didn't even touch it. I mean, didn't even, consider, didn't even notice the thing. So he waits t five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Nobody's coming back. You know, so I, I was hoping that some friends will, uh, will, will ask me if this was a you know, great joke that they did. So he says, an hour later, I'm calling the police and saying, hey, I had a robber and this is what happened. He explains the story. And two hours later, the police calls him and say, hey, uh, come over to identify your stolen goods. He says, well, how is it possible? Well, the guys tried to spend the thousand. They couldn't in here. They couldn't there. No one's going to take it. So they went to break it in the bank. All right. <laughs> and, and then the, the security guard uh, you know, said, oh, this must be a fake. So they called the uh, Secret Service. <laughs> and Secret Service came in and while they were exchanging the thousand dollar for twenties, Secret Service took them in and said, oh, how do you have the thousand? Well, we have this and this. Well, we have it reported stolen and the serial number on the thousand dollar bill is matching. So, you know, they throw them in jail. But the point is in 2003, people, robbers will walk, you know, uh, 10, 20 gold coins there, or 40 gold coins, and they wouldn't even touch it. They wouldn't reckon, they, they wouldn't even find it to be valuable. They can't spell it for what it's worth. So, this is what makes uh, gold a great investment. The mere fact that few people have bought it, it's like buying a house in 2000 or 1999. And finally,